politicians to protect the armed forces. Join me, Mark White, on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Hey, welcome along. A busy day at Westminster as the government tries to figure out how many extra quid they can screw out of you for the wasteland they have made all around. I'm just trying to look on the bright side here, but we're going to get into it with uh, David Starkey. And if you're wondering where all that money goes, well, you'll be relieved to hear it's not going to Richard Martin at the Blazing Donkey Hotel. He'll tell us why. Our leaders are insane. And Leilani Dowding and Ava Vladingerbroke are both here to consider the implications of that. And of course, the most important part of the show, that is you. Do you feel that the tax burden upon you should be even higher? Are you anxious uh, to give a few more billions uh, to walking around money in Ukraine? Uh, should we expedite the process and simply pile up every £20 note in the country at, say, the uh, former royal showgrounds at Stoneleigh and have the king ceremonially set them alight. You can email me, ask me anything you'd like, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can Twitter me at gbnews. A full hour of news and analysis coming your way after Tamsin Roberts with the latest headlines. Mark, thank you and good evening from the GB Newsroom. The Chancellor's delivered his plans to get the economy back on track as he acknowledges the UK's already in recession. As part of his autumn statement, Jeremy Hunt has reduced the threshold for the higher rate of income tax from £150,000 to just over £125,000. The state pension, benefits and tax credits will rise in line with inflation by more than 10%. Millions of households will pay more in energy bills from April, the typical bill rising from £2,500 to £3,000 as the government reduces the level of support. And energy firms will be hit with an expanded windfall tax of 35% up from 25%. The Chancellor has vowed to protect the poorest and believes his plan will help rebuild the economy. What can we do with our plan for stability and our plan for growth? Well. The Office for Budget Responsibility, which is an independent organisation, they say that what we're doing will reduce the impact of that fall in living standards by half next year. So we are helping every bit as much as we can. And we're also saying to people that as we do that, 
we're protecting the public services that really matter, the NHS, schools, uh, the things that are going to help us get through to the other side and become a, a really strong, dynamic economy, which is what we all want. Well, following the statement, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves accused the Conservatives of failing to learn from decisions made over the past decade. This government has forced our economy into a doom loop, where low growth leads to higher taxes, lower investments and squeezed wages, with a running down of public services, all of which hits economic growth again. And instead of learning from the mistakes of the last decade, they're simply repeating them. We need to break free from this vicious cycle of stagnation with fairer choices and a proper plan for economic growth. Household disposable incomes are heading for their biggest fall on record, according to the Office for Budget Responsibility. The OBR says that once rising prices are taken into account, people's incomes would drop by 7% in the next two fiscal years. The government's forecaster also says living standards won't recover to last year's levels for another six years. Royal Mail postal workers have announced a further six strike dates in the run-up to Christmas. The Communication Workers' Union says the new walkouts will happen on the 9th, 11th, 14th, 15th, 23rd and 24th of December. The industrial action is in addition to three strikes later this month and on the 1st of December. Meanwhile, ground handlers at London's Heathrow Airport will begin a 72-hour strike from tomorrow in a dispute over pay. The Unite Union said the strike action is by workers at aviation services firm Menzies. It'll affect a range of airlines and disrupt a number of flights from terminals 2, 3 and 4. Nancy Pelosi has stepped down as Speaker of the US House of Representatives. Her announcement comes after the Democrats lost the House to the Republicans in the midterm elections. The Republicans will swear in the new Speaker in January next year. Nancy Pelosi will stay in Congress as a backbench lawmaker. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Mark. Thank you, Tamsin. As I often remark, this, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and its territories and possessions around the globe, is a great nation. It is the nation that more than any other can plausibly claim to be the nation that built the modern world. But it has screwed itself most comprehensively, so that according to the Bank of England, for whatever that's worth, we're now facing the longest recession since the 1920s, uh, and if you think that it's just a question of taking the pain for another six months or so, well, by 2025, we will be the only developed nation whose economy has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Right now, we have the sharpest decline in GDP in Europe. Let's take a look at this. Oh, that's us on the far left. Appropriately enough, we're at sub-basement level nine. And who's that over on the right soaring into the stratosphere with 3.2% growth? Oh, my word, that's those twinkling Irish charmers. If you're watching this in uh, Dublin or Waterford or Shannon or Dundalk and you have an idea as to why you've got 3.2% growth, and uh, your old tyrannous masters are down in the basement, do uh, drop me an email, uh, gbviews at gbnews.uk, and tell me why, because we'd really like to know. Here's another graph from my old friends at The Spectator. Disposable income is set to fall further than at any time in the last two-thirds of a century, and uh, by a lot more. See that deep red line? Uh, over there. That's you. That's the economic context of today's autumn's, autumn statement. In political terms, though, uh, this statement is what usually happens when a new government takes office and wishes to correct the mistakes of its predecessor, as, say, Mrs. Thatcher's ministry did a few weeks in with Sir Geoffrey Howe's mini-budget of 1979, repudiating the failed Labour government of the previous years. Except, of course, in this case, 
Rishi Sunak's ministry is endeavouring to correct all the mistakes made by uh, Rishi Sunak. It's very hard to pass yourself off as Nelson Mandela when you've been Hendrik Verwerd for the entirety of your cabinet career. At any rate, you guys are poorer because of what he did in 2020, which is apparently too far back for anyone to remember. And now he's proposing to make you poorer still to correct what he did way back in 2020. You're paying the price for these guys' appalling screw-up. We'll get into this with David Starkey, but in a sane world, nobody who had anything to do with the last three years, nobody would be eligible uh, for further public office. Unfortunately, that doesn't leave very many of our current political class. Uh, Westminster was divided between the lockdown party and the even more lockdown party. And if you're in the devolved nations, it's the even more, even more lockdown party. But at the very least, we should require of the men who afflict us a public repudiation of what they've been doing. Instead, these sick, decadent wastrels are continuing exactly as before. You now have to bear the highest tax burden since the Second World War. But that was because we just fought the Second World War. So what's the excuse this time? Our prime minister back then was Winston Churchill. There he is. You remember him? The bloke who said, we shall fight on the beaches. His grandson is a chap called Rupert Soames, who's the chief exec of Serco, and therefore has no desire to fight them on the beaches. Instead, he welcomes them to the beaches. A thousand a night through the Border Force RNLI Express check-in, which is pretty sweet for Serco, because they have the contract to provide accommodation for quote-unquote asylum seekers. And that's just tuppenny halfpenny snuff uh, when it's a couple dozen asylum seekers here and there. But at a thousand a night, that's a gangbusters business model. Serco also cleaned up on the COVID because they had the contract for the stupid waste of time contact tracing. So you can't say they're not a versatile company. COVID is track and trace. Open borders is no track, no trace. We'll get into a particularly shameful example of that with Leilani Dowding. But from Winston Churchill to Rupert Soames is the history of Britain in three generations of the same family. From we shall fight on the beaches to we shall welcome them on the beaches and say, come on down, and then we'll stick the British taxpayers with the tab. You're paying more taxes so that Winston Churchill's successor can pay Winston Churchill's grandson to put up every Albanian male under 53 in a country hotel. There's no point you putting up with the worst inflation in 40 years, the biggest drop in disposable income in six and a half decades, and the highest tax burden in three quarters of a century if this deranged government is just carrying on as usual. So when Granny's turning blue in February, and you've just noticed she hasn't moved in an hour and a quarter, it's worth remembering the cost of HMG's inability to solve the problems it's created. We'll get to it all tonight with David Starkey, Ava Velardingerbrook, and Leilani Dowding. But we might as well start with the one place your money isn't being thrown away, and that would be the Blazing Donkey Hotel in Ham, which is near Sandwich in Kent. The owner has just turned down an offer from the Home Office of over a million quid to house a bunch of asylum seekers for the next year. Uh, Richard Martin joins me from the Blazing Donkey, along with GB News Home and Security Editor Mark uh, White. Mark, uh, you're going to be doing more on this uh, story tomorrow here uh, uh, at GB News. How, how typical uh, is the situation with Richard Martin uh, to what's going on all over the country? 
Well, it's interesting. We'll, we'll be going in to find Richard uh, very soon. Uh, you're right. I think there are a few hoteliers up and down the country now that are, in a way, fighting back, deciding that they're not just going to give up their business and their hotel uh, to what would be, for their businesses, they say, certain death. Because if it's turned over for asylum seekers for a year, they're going to lose their customer base. The hotel, as they found out from others in the past, is going to be effectively trashed and they're going to lose all their employees as well that's why Richard Martin didn't want to turn over the blazing donkey and I've been here throughout the day Mark and it is a lovely hotel I'm just going to take you inside you can see for yourself Robert Jenrick uh, our esteemed immigration minister he said that he wanted asylum seekers to stay in basic accommodation well if you've been here this is not basic uh, first of all, just in through the door, uh, just on the, the right there, you can see uh, the restaurant. It's now closed for business for this evening, but does a roaring trade. And it is an award winner, the coveted Rosetta AA uh, award that uh, IT has picked up for uh, the meals that they cook. That would have to close down, though, uh, because this is a basic contract that the Home Office contractors were going to offer uh, for the services of this hotel to house these asylum seekers. So the staff here would be made redundant. I want to take you just further through. Uh, you can see lovely area. It's very nice and warm in here, I have to say. You can see the uh, next to these two customers roaring fire. That might actually be a comfort for uh, many of the asylum seekers, probably remind them of the, the blazing fires around the jungles in Cali and in Dunkirk. But this particular area up here, Mark, it would close down as well because it wouldn't be part of the enhanced service that the hotel is offering. The bar area would close down and all of the employees, there's 25 here at the moment, but in peak season there's 50 employees, they would lose their job. And the man himself, Richard Martin, uh, the man who's turned down this offer can speak to us. Uh, tell us, uh, as I do a quick uh, pirouette, uh, why you decided to turn this down. £1.1 million. It was an obvious choice, to be honest. Um, the, the, the approach came and they, they said it was 100% occupancy and we really didn't understand how they were going to, to do that. And then when we understood that it involved closing the operation down uh, completely other than uh, accommodation, it just couldn't work for us. We've got here, as you just mentioned, 25 staff. Um, we have uh, next year alone 100 wedding couples planning their day, dreaming of a, a fantastic day for, 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 the, for themselves. Beyond that, until 2025, loads of booking. So if we entertain something like this, we'd have to just stop all of that and just look after the asylum seekers. Because not only that, um, it's only going to be a, a one-hit wonder. We're, we've been here since 92, so we want to be here for a, you know, a, another long period of time. It's been a life's work for our family as the Blazing Donkey, and um, we're really proud of it. And if we were to dismantle what we've worked for now, it's going to be you know, sacrilege. So we, we just weren't interested at all. We know that some other hoteliers have, have done the same as you. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself as taking a, a bit of a, a stand here in the hope that maybe other hoteliers will be uh, more careful about turning over their, in some cases, life's businesses for a quick buck that might actually hurt them in the end? Well, it's going to depend on each individual circumstance. If you were on your uppers and you needed the money, then the decision-making process might be harder for you. But for us, um, we're blessed with having a solid business that we've built up over a lot of years, so we don't have that problem. But my advice will always be think beyond the 12 months what's going to happen in two years, in five years. So we still want to be here doing what we're doing. Yeah. Now, I know that Mark Stein would probably uh, have a, a question or two he wants to ask us as well. One interesting thing I found out about the Blazing Donkey, Mark, is that it has been uh, nominated or, or uh, recognised as one of the top glamping sites in the country as well. They've got uh, glamping huts and tents out there that are luxurious, yeah. that have copper baths in. They're absolutely beautiful. But they would be turned over if they had taken up this contract to the asylum seekers as well. It, it does seem incredible. Well, could, could you ask, Richard, maybe you know the answer to this uh, too, Mark. Uh, I, I take it Richard went into the hotel business because he wanted to be a hotelier. R running a migrant hostel is a change of, is a change of profession for Richard, but it's, a, it's also a change of use for the business. Uh, does that have to be cleared through the council? 
Richard? Uh, I'm unaware of the legalities of it, but certainly uh, it, it would strike me as a change of use. The very notion of um, an asylum seeker um, bathing in a jacuzzi hot tub in a luxurious um, safari tent or, <laughs> or, or shepherd's hut or one of our lovely rooms just beggars belief. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It doesn't sound right. So it's just not us. Uh. And you can't mix the two. You're, I think you're right about that. It's a beautiful looking hotel. Um, do you, why do you, why would the staff wish to leave? Is it because uh, it's simply not pleasant to suddenly be uh, serving, you know, hundreds of uh, so-called asylum seekers rather than guests who are going there for a wedding or an anniversary or a, a break or whatever? Well, not so much, but the contract that was presented to us was that um, they just required accommodation only. They have their own subcontractors for all the catering. So the only staff, oh. and in fact, they've also got their subcontractors for the housekeeping side too. So in effect, it's not a question of a choice of the staff. It would be an essential measure that we'd have to take because all the government through this agency were looking for was a roof over the heads of these asylum seekers, which I get. They need to put them somewhere, but it just wouldn't work here. And the staff wouldn't be required if it was to take place. And it's interesting because I was speaking, Mark, to a number of those members of staff today and they, understandably, they love it here. It's like a family-run mm. business mm. and some of the hotel staff actually live on the premises. So they were saying to me, look, yeah. you know, I'm not just going to lose my job in these circumstances. I'm going to lose my place to live, my home. Uh, so it has yeah. much deeper effects than simply just having to look for another job. No, this, this smells even more like a racket then. In other words, they take your building and, they've, uh, and they move in their staff to cater to these migrants. It's absolutely incredible. God bless you, Richard, for turning these guys down. And I hope more hoteliers Thank will you. have the courage uh, to tell His Majesty's government to stick it where the sun don't shine. Thank you very much, Mark. Mark White will have more on this story tomorrow on GB News from uh, breakfast onwards. But don't worry, folks. Some other hotel will get that million quid plus. It all sounds so boringly green eye shade when they're talking about GDP and marginal tax rates. But you're paying for madness. And the madness is expanding. And those idiots at the dispatch box today are happy to throw even more of your money away. We'll have more on that in a moment with Leilani Dowding. And still to come on yet another day when you've been screwed over by the political class, David Starkey and Ava Velardinger broke her hair. Don't touch that dial, we're coming right back. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. 
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. GB News is the people's channel, so if we're not listening to the people, we're not doing it right. Uh, with Britain facing the biggest fall in living standards on record, we wanted to know what you made of the government spending over £2 billion a year. I actually think that's a bit of a lowball estimate myself. Don't know where it came from. Over £2 billion a year on hotels for illegal migrants and or asylum seekers. Catty or Katie, C-A-T-I, Catty, Katie, says, ah, oh, there it is, blame the migrant card. Listen carefully, Miss Catty, Katie. I'm actually blaming, I'm not blaming, I don't blame an Albanian or a Somali or a Sudan Sudanese uh, for figuring uh, that he'd uh, rather live in the Cotswolds than his native land. I don't blame him for that at all. I blame our lousy, stinking, rotten government and the lousy, stinking, rotten opposition party that supports... And in fairness to the lousy, stinking, rotten opposition party, at least they're lefty progressives, so they've got a general predisposition toward open borders. What's the Conservatives' uh, excuse? And by the way... On these, this is why I don't blame the migrants and why I do blame Rishi and Jeremy and the rest of these guys. A thousand a night. That's, that's, uh, that's what they, they're, they're bringing in on a good night now. A thousand a night. That adds up to about half of all the babies born in the United Kingdom in a uh, single day, which is 2,000 and change. Um, so... So uh, you're basically increasing your population growth by 50% just in the guys who are arriving at Dover and Folkestone. Nice try, Catty. I'm not blaming the migrants. I'm blaming the government and I'm blaming people like Catty who think it's enough to go, oh, let's just blame the migrant card. He's playing, blame the migrant. I'm blaming you, Catty, Katie, Catty, Katie. Here is Miss Leilani Dowding just one week ago. Oh, where are we? <laughs> That's Leilani <laughs> Dowding right now. She looks like we pre-taped her a week ago, but in fact, are you here in the flesh? I'm I can't. here in the flesh. They have such good <laughs> animatronic models now, I can't tell. Anyway, do we have the Leilani clip from a week ago? Here it comes. There was just a young boy raped in a migrant centre, yeah. um, and Diane Abbott came out with this insane tweet yeah. that... Um, it was Sue Ella's fault. Yeah, that it was Sue Ella's fault and, yeah. you know, you shouldn't treat them like, like rapists or they become rapists. Well, yeah. uh, you know, what, what planet are we on? What planet are we on indeed? Well, you'll be thrilled to hear. This is how... 
you know, they, they say to you, oh, we've got to tax you more. You're going to have the biggest fall in living standards, uh, highest tax burden since the end of the Second World War. What do you get in return? You will be thrilled to hear that that accused rapist has gone missing. When the 39-year-old suspect was accused by the boy of rape, he was then arrested. Are you bonkers? Maybe if he'd misgendered the trans outreach officer and said their Macarena routine was a stinker, then he might have been arrested. No, the accused rapist is out on bail and was simply moved from the hotel in Waltham Forest, where it might be a little bit distressing for the boy to be around him, run into him in the corridor and over the coffee machine, to another hotel in Buckingham and he's now disappeared. The Home Office say the police are responsible for escorting him to his new hotel, while the police say the Home Office is responsible for transporting him to his accommodation. It doesn't matter. They're both crap. And as of today, you're paying even more for them. Leilani Dowding is here with me. Leilani, it beggars belief that, that you can be credibly accused of rape and you're now just roaming Buckinghamshire. And rape of a minor as well. Mm. Mm. So how was this person not in a secure facility? That's what I want to know. Mm. Or why wasn't, weren't they being transferred to a secure facility? And why was no one there, you know, that yeah. could really take charge of escorting him and make sure he got to the place? It just, it does beg belief. It's just unbelievable that this is happening and happening on our dime and on our watch. And what, what's going on? Well, the interesting thing is that it doesn't even come up when these guys are budgeting, but it's a huge amount of money. You just think about the people, just in the, you know, you can't get anybody to come and respond to you if you get burgled or even if you get assaulted these days. But at the same time, we're bringing in an extra thousand yep. people uh, who are causing even more uh, crime for the police to not solve. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you've just brought up Serco as well mm. um, and, and what's happened there. The um, Tory MP Jonathan Gillis from Stoke and Trent North actually brought him up in Parliament mm. um, and the immigration minister didn't seem to care. What his suggestion was, actually, instead of them going um, into these big hotels um, and, and taking over big towns, mm. his suggestion was they were going to disperse them more evenly, put them into smaller towns, maybe oh. even little villages. So, you know, are we safe? Absolutely not. Does that make anything better? No, absolutely not. This is not a solution to anything. Um, and again, Serco is involved. And like we've discussed before, yeah. um, not only are they taking over hotels, firing staff, like yep. the, there was a young couple on Nigel's show yesterday yeah. that have been thrown out of um, the hotel that they looked after, um, given 24 hours notice to move somewhere else with their three children. Yeah. You have that going on. Serco are also, you know, saying to landlords, we'll give you a five year contract with no break in it. Um, so basically, they'll take over your property for five mm. years, do all the maintenance, no um, management charges, no estate agent charges, you know, just kick out the Brits that mm. live there and, and put the, these people in. And there's just not but the infrastructure. But this is being done on the sly. Like Rupert, Rupert Soames, I don't know anything about Rupert Soames. I think I met his, his brother a couple of times over the years. But Rupert Soames, like Churchill's grandson, he's plugged in, he's well connected. Why the hell should this company basically have had its economic fortunes transformed by what's supposed to be a humanitarian crisis? Either it's a humanitarian crisis or it's an opportunity for well-connected Tories to get rich, but it shouldn't actually be both. Well, this is it, a 2.9 billion contract, I think, they mm. got. So there's there's a lot of money going around mm. to house these um, illegals. And there isn't the infrastructure, not in our big cities, not in our small mm. towns, not in our villages, to be able to um, even look after our own people, never mind <laughs> a thousand <laughs> illegal immigrants coming in a night. But you yeah. know what? I think they're missing a trick, Mark, because, you know, as you see, they're mostly men. Yeah. Um, but with, you know, it's 2022, they could skew the data and just identify as women and, and skew all the data up, you know? Yeah, no, no, you're right. We would have the greatest women's swim team if we could... Per I'm not sure these are the kind of guys you can persuade to transition. <laughs> I'm not sure, given uh, their uh, confessional inclinations, whether they'd be happy living in a town called Ham, uh, apart <laughs> from anything else. Uh, and if you then tell them uh, you want them to transition so they're going to 
to be the uh, the uh, the Northern Irish ladies swimming team at the next Commonwealth Games. I don't think they're going to be happy about this, Leilani. Uh, thank you again. This is what the autumn statement is funding. Accused rapists in hotels at your expense. Uh, uh, and you're paying for them, and then the incompetent Home Office and incompetent police lose track of them. Uh, coming up, the autumn statement means you're going to be paying more for things. David Starkey will look at that straight ahead. And later on, uh, oh, no, no, uh, later on, uh, we have Ava, who's, I can't tell who's coming next. Ava Valadinger broke on G20 theatrics and the looming global vaccine passport. Thank you very much, Leilani. See you next time. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. The players change, but the script doesn't. Here's His Majesty's two senior prime ministers speaking today to Ukraine's president. Please go ahead, you're mine. Hello, Vladimir. It's Rishi and Justin. I really wanted you to hear from us as friends. It's Rishi and Justin. I really wanted you to hear from us as friends. Volodymyr has never met Rishi, and it would be unreasonable to expect him to keep up with all those rotating PMs who aren't there long enough to jet into Kiev for a walkabout. So he could be forgiven for going Rishi who? 
And yet he and Rishi are already good friends, apparently already on a first name basis. Isn't that sweet? Volodymyr was friends with Liz, friends with Boris, and now friends with Rishi. They all hate each other. But in the Zelensky Rolodex, the enemy of my friend is just my latest friend for the next month or so. It's almost as if it makes no difference who's uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. My next guest, however, is a man who can ascend the Downing Street staircase and know the difference between the second Earl of Liverpool and the third Duke of Portland without having to peer at the portrait labels. There they are, by the way. I'm not going to tell you which one is the Duke of Portland and which one is Lord Liverpool. Uh, by the way, if President Zelensky is tuned in and isn't familiar with the second Earl of Liverpool and the third Duke of Portland, that would be Bob and Bill to you, Volodymyr. They just want you to hear from them as friends. David Starkey joins me for the big picture on this autumn statement. What does it say in the 13th year of Conservative government that this is what we've come to? It's extraordinary, isn't it? We've invented a new tradition. Mm. The great tradition of mm. British government used to be that it was the Labour Party that buggered the economy. Mm. Now we have the Conservatives doing uh, a very uh, uh, effective... It's a bit like the World Cup, a really uh, good substitute yeah. routine. Because can I just remind everybody, we've been hearing Rachel Reeves, the uh, Shadow Chancellor, say it is, you know, again, how a Wilson Tribute Act, uh, 12 years of Tory uh, misrule. Can I remind <laughs> everybody how the last year of the Labour government ended? It ended with the then Chief Secretary of the Treasury, mm -hmm. two, Gordon Brown, mm -hmm. the man who saved the world, mm -hmm. Liam Byrne, leaving a little note for his Tory successor, mm -hmm. which said, I'm afraid there is no money mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. What we're reaping now isn't... Obviously, you were right. It's the reward of COVID. But it's not just the reward of COVID, it's the reward of sustained policy mistakes mm. that go right back to 1997. Fundamentally, we've had no... The terrible thing is, mm. you were saying we've had all these prime ministers. More importantly, we've had no change of government. Right. The, the Conservative government, pseudo-Conservative mm. governments that have came in after New Labour simply adopted the same catastrophic policies of an over-expansion of the public sector that was not sustained mm. by real economic growth. So I'm afraid we're stuffed. Yeah. It's really, I mean, quite simply. Well, what, well, I, find, I, find, what I find interesting is about, about that is when these new guys came in, like David... Uh, Cameron 12 years ago, and they're at pains to be not to be the nasty part. Oh, yeah. Oh, we as, mustn't be nasty. As Theresa May said. Yeah. We must be. Comp Can I say that? Sorry, this is a really important point. Compassion is a private Christian virtue. Right. It is not an attribute of sound government. Mm. Listen to what we've just done. Mm. We've said we are going to protect the pensioners and we're going to protect people on benefits. Mm. What that means is you protect the economically inactive mm. against people like you, me and everybody else mm. who pays tax, who is economically active. Could there be a more stupid way of managing policy? Well, it's 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 absolutely destructive, I would have thought, to the whole point. I mean, uh, people took that seriously, that business of the nasty party. And as you know, David Cameron uh, decided he didn't want anything to do with horrible social conservatism. So uh, he, he was very modish, progressive. He uh, introduced... Loved gay marriage. Yes. My dear, him and Justin. I mean, virtually you expected them to walk up the aisle together. <laughs> well, the funny thing, the thing that just made me, uh, you know, uh, sick of the sanctimonious little prig, when he was asked, why was he doing this despite being a conservative? And he said, it's not despite being a conservative, it's because that I'm a conservative. And, you, of course, you I want say, everybody to be able to get yeah. married, he said. <laughs> and yeah. you just, and, but people assume while they're doing all that and they're rolling their eyes that the fiscal conservative... OK, he's getting rid of everything else, but the fiscal conservatism will remain. Now that's gone. Completely. But, you see, it, it's intrinsic to what happened. If you simply do follow on from Blair, mm. what did Blair do? Mm. He arbitrarily increased the funding of the NHS at a single go mm. to match the European average. Mm. All that happens is you inflate salaries. Then you get the catastrophe of Patricia Hewitt and the renegotiation of the GP contract. Mm. And what does she do? She values 
hours. Mm. A GP is operating out of hours mm. in the evenings at weekend. Do you know how much it was valued no. at for that contract? £10,000 a year. It's hardly the cost of no. putting up one of your immigrants for a week no. in a semi-luxurious hotel. Yeah. I mean, the sh in other words, the collapse of the GP service goes back directly right. to that. But the bigger issue, isn't it, is a conservatism that stopped being conservative. There's, there is, should be one single centre of conservatism, which is the defence of property. It mm. is because of the defence of property that we've had prosperity, the Industrial Revolution, mm. which enables to enjoy all these nice things. Yeah. And we've lost sight of that. We imagine money grows, you know. You water yeah. it, Jen, you water it with the tears of compassion and it sprouts. It doesn't work like well, that. Well, and property is undermined on every, every front, front now, uh, every including, front. You know, not just in the personal sense, you can't get the police to attend a burglary, but the islands themselves uh, have become like a, uh, you know, a semi-detached home that's just getting in, broken into routinely. With ah. its fences out of repair. Yeah. But I'm using property in a much wider sense. Yeah, I'm using yeah. it in the sense of the right to the fruit of your labour. Yeah. This yeah. is the central thing. This is what actually reshaped the world. It's mm. why we had an industrial revolution. And remember, oh. industrial revolution itself is now a dirty word yeah. because it dirted the planet. So we have a conservative party that devotes itself to this absurdity of net zero. But, but you're, you're absolutely right to talk uh, about that because it's property right. Property rights in the functioning parts of the world whether you're talking about Singapore or Hong Kong or anywhere or even, else. even Ireland. Yes. Your remarks about Ireland were brilliant. Mm. And why... Have you had any replies on that? Uh, I haven't looked, because well, I... Can I, well, can I give you the reply for okay. you? Ireland does not have a welfare state. No. Ireland no. neither has a welfare state, nor does it have a history of 19th century industrialisation. And these are the two catastrophes. Remember, the first time that a person on ordinary mm. income pays income tax is not the Second World War, it's mm. 1945 with the introduction of the welfare state. Yeah. That's the thing that completely yeah. alters it. Churchill knew when he came to power in 51 that he should have tried to do something about the structure of the NHS. Right. Yeah. He chickened out in exactly the same way that, that David Cameron uh, uh, chickened out of doing anything about new Labour. And the result is you just get a continuous ratchet of disastrous error after disastrous mm. error after disastrous error. And you, me and everybody else is left with picking up the price. Yep, that's, that's very well put. And he has uh, answered our Irish question too. A very good point. I remember uh, taking the night boat uh, from Dunleary to Holyhead with uh, uh, people, basically Irish persons, going to Wales to see if they could benefit from the welfare state. Sad. Um, uh, what, uh, what else has Rishi been doing? He's been at the G20. I, I showed you him doing his Elvis impersonation yesterday. We're going to get into that with Ava Valardinger broke in just a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners. 
on TV, radio and online. This is GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Even as he's decimating your finances, what do we find Rishi Sunak signing on to at this week's G20? No, 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 not that. After the Klaus Schwab karaoke night in the matching shirts, look at the final communique. This little interesting passage here. We acknowledge the importance of shared technical standards and verification methods under the framework of the IHR 2005 to facilitate seamless international travel, interoperability and recognizing digital solutions and non-digital solutions, including proof of vaccinations. So seamless international travel, freedom of movement, will depend on proof of vaccination. So Rishi Sunak, even as he tries to back the ship of state off the iceberg he steered us into a couple of years ago, has already signed us up to the next iceberg. Here's the Indonesian health minister, Mr. Sadikin. If you have been vaccinated or tested properly, then you can move around. So for the next pandemic, instead of stopping the movement of the people 100%, which clogged the economy globally, you know, you can still provide some movement of the people. Indonesia has achieved, G20 country has agreed to have this digital certificate using WHO standard, and we will submit into the next the uh, World Health Assembly in Geneva as the revision to international health regulation. Oh, you can move around if you have a digital certificate. That's awfully generous of them. Uh, Ava Valardingerbrook is with us. You got your digital certificate yet? Mm, I do not, and I don't think <laughs> I will, but it looks like I'll have a very uh, upsetting future if I don't. Mm. It's, it's weird, this, um, because it's ever more obvious that they've taken... Whatever this virus was, wherever it started, whatever it did, uh, they want to make the world they built in response to it permanent. Yeah, they're not going to let it go. Mm. That's, it, it's just so noticeable how now any type of logic, it's just out of the window. Mm. We had the, the head of, of, of the management department of Pfizer mm. admit that the, the vaccine was never even tested to stop transmission. Mm. That was the whole idea no, behind no. This, this passport, right, the vaccine passport, right. that it would help that. Everything is out in the open now. Everybody knows it doesn't work. Yet the people in force, they still, they just go along with it again. They just push it again. It never ends. Are you surprised at the way people think? Because, uh, you know, before the First World War, so going back 110 years, most people didn't have passports and didn't need passports. They could move around Europe fairly openly. Now we have a situation where the governments will be able to know everything about a person. Just, uh, you mentioned that when you were at Heathrow, you just, you have to go biometrically through Heathrow now. Uh, are you surprised at the way people accept all this so easily? Um, yes, I am. I'm surprised that they do. But then again, 
It is almost like everything that was once up is now down, and that's the type of rhetoric that they use. The same with this mm. Indonesian health minister. The way they speak about it is they mm. say, oh, we will facilitate movement. Yes. You know, so it's the yeah. exact opposite of what they actually do, which is restrict movement. Yeah. If you don't do exactly what they say, and they paint it to be, oh, we'll do this in case you know we have another pandemic, which apparently is also a fact. Yes. Uh, now it's just like, oh, <laughs> we will have another pandemic, and then they say, and then this way, you know, we will have not everyone locked up, but just a certain few. <laughs> well, what I don't like about that is it, 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 it implicit in it is that the state has the right to decide whether you can move around. Mm. Um, I accept that the right to the government, if I want to go to Bali, the government of Indonesia has to give me permission to admit me when I get there. But we're not talking about that. The, 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 the idiot health secretary who's now on some stupid reality show, Matt Hancock, here, he wanted uh, these vaccine passports for moving around the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that if, you, if you're in Wales and you want to go to Northern Ireland or you're in Northern Ireland and you want to go to Northern England, you've got to show papers. But this, I think, is the fundamental question that we should address here, is that people have forgotten what the state is for and mm. that the state serves the citizen, not the other way around. Mm. If you have an entire population that apparently seems to forget that they pay up to probably half of their income in taxes. Yes. <laughs> then, and that there is a reason for that. You do that so that the state supposedly hmm. would do things in your interest. Instead, the state treats us as criminals. You are right. treated as a criminal. You have to give your fingerprints everywhere you go. Mm. Biomatic data. You have mm. to have a vaccine passport. Mm. Everything goes by their standards. And the presumption of innocence is flipped around. Now mm. it's every citizen is guilty until proven innocent. Yep. And they do it with nice words. So this way we can combat fraud. This way we can end money laundering. Mm. All of these things. And people fall for it because we don't understand the concept anymore that the state is here to serve us not the other way around. And, and what's interesting, I think, is if you'd said any of this stuff about vaccine passports, if you'd said basically three years ago, uh, oh, wait a minute, freedom of movement is not going to be a thing in the 2020s, people would have thought you were bonkers. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you, would, you required permission to get on a train or a bus or all kinds of things. And it makes me wonder how fast this is going to accelerate, because it's all happened. Very, the last two years have happened extremely fast. Yes. And they're still planning to intensify it. Yes, I, I, I think that's something very dangerous interest in the human hmm. human mind or in the human soul. We've seen it also, something that's always surprised me during the, the peak, you know, of the refugee crisis, for example, hmm. in 2015, when we were having all of these Islamic terror attacks. Right. And you'd think at a certain point, if you have those continuously, almost every month was, you know, another yeah, one, no, yeah, that yeah. people would stand up and say, we can't accept this, and that they see, oh, it's the state who did this to us by letting all of these migrants yeah. in, in the first place. Instead, the only thing that happens was people got more subdued. They got used to it. Yeah. And that is something very dangerous about the human condition, I think, that we're seeing play out in real time here. Well, and they, in fact, they gave more power to the state so that if you go to these ancient thousand-year-old Christmas markets in French and German towns, they now have these ugly bollards and uh, concrete barriers everywhere. And people, oh, that's good, yeah. Now I need, to, I need to have security at my Christmas market. What a nice, benevolent state. Thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Ava. Uh, uh, tell you what, I have two words for you. They're the most exciting words in television. Coming up right now, Dan Wooten to Thump Your Thursday. What you got, oh, Dan? Oh, Mark Stein, nothing is more exciting than you. Uh, look, you were obviously invoking Winston Churchill earlier, weren't you, in, uh, in, in your uh, Stein line. And I think, actually, tonight, the big question is, what is the Conservative Party now? Does it have a future? I'm angry today after the mini-budgets. We've got a plethora of guests on that, Mark. Oh, no one does plethoras like you, Dan, and you should be angry at what this... I can't believe this, what the Conservative Party has been reduced to. I would love to wake up and find the third Marquess of Salisbury was back in number 10 and this had all been a bad dream. That's all coming up with Dan after the break. Stay safe, stay free.
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy.